So I would like to welcome you to Campcom Breakfast Seminar. Uh, my name is Anna Louise Johnson. I'm the CEO for Campcom Research and Technology Stock. Um, most of you, maybe some of you don't know anything about Campcom, so I'm going to just give you a very quick introduction uh, to us before I introduce our speaker today. Um, Campcom we are a company, a specialist company, providing solutions and products and specialist services. Um, so we have we have our own product. It's uh, mainly a radar. It's a 77 gigahertz radar, not school detection radar. Uh, but we mainly produce or develop products for our customers. So we developed more than 10 products. Um, for example, the 66 gigahertz point-to-point -point microwave link. Um, and we provide specialist services. So within our competences, we can provide uh, services to our customers as well. The key areas is wireless connectivity. So all radio technology, including 5G, we are part of uh, Internetic, one of these 5G development programs in the EU, where we are the only SME among all the, the giants of uh, Ericsson, Norway, and Intel, and Samsung, and so on. Um, we also very active in uh, autonomous systems, especially then on the autonomous drive side, uh, coming from that, uh, the companies originating from the Gothenburg area. And then industrial IT, and the industrial IT area comes really from the competence that we have uh, and what we developed in the other areas where we see ourselves, uh, where you require the, the competence to provide robust, low latency uh, and other requirements on the systems in the IoT area. Our key competences, uh, we can develop the complete product and we have that competence in-house. So the hardware side, all from the mechanics, electronics, FPGA, to the embedded software side, to the system level, so <coughs> all included. Uh, we also have, I mean, more system level competences on the signal processing, image processing side, uh, as well as communication system, radar, of course, functional safety, and, and so on. Uh, the company is, uh, from Gothenburg from the beginning and was founded in 2001. Uh, so the main hub is in Gothenburg. We have a hub here right now in uh, Shista, or Shista Moon, actually, in this building. And then we also started up hubs in Linköping, Wellington in New Zealand, uh, Greensboro, US. We are more than 100 developers within the Campcom Research and Technology. Um, we have a lot of people coming from very strong academic uh, backgrounds. So uh, more than 35% in total have a PhD background um, and we have a lot of master engineers uh, coming from industry and an average of 16, 17 years um, of industry uh, experience and, uh, and we actually don't uh, employ people with less than six years of industry experience so that we can keep our specialist profile. So that is us. So now to our speaker today, Olaf Schindler. Um, so Olaf is a co-founder and director of uh, the free and open source silicon um, movement. Foundation. Foundation. Ah, oh, yeah, that's the right word. <laughs> uh, and that's what he's going to talk about uh, today. Um, he is also very active in a lot of different projects, so he will give some insights into those projects as well. Uh, furthermore, he is an organizer of Orcon, uh, open source digital design conference. It's been running for five years. So he's very active, and when he has some time, he also works for Camcom as a specialist, <laughs> uh, and he's based in, in Gothenburg. Welcome. Okay, so I can start by asking uh, you of your experience. Um, has anyone here been working with FPGAs? A few, and ASICs? Even fewer, and how about software directly interfacing chips, like embedded software? Quite a few more. That's generally how it is. So what I would like to call this is the next logical step. We have now seen open source for a long time in uh, software. It's creeping down uh, down the layers, even if it's most dominant in the middle layer in the and in the uh, web web stacks. So if we take a <coughs> minute to talk about open source silicon, we must first define what is silicon in this context, and. When I talk about silicon, I talk about the tools and the code used to design and build uh, chips, e either 
the classic chips, as most people know them, the ASICs, which has a single function, uh, even if it's a programmable uh, functionality like a CPU. You can program a CPU, but you can't change the chip itself. FPGAs, on the other hand, are completely reprogrammable chips uh, with the cost that they are much more expensive, they are slower, more power hungry. But a mistake doesn't necessarily cost you millions of dollars, which can be good. So to build open source chips, we use HDL code to write RTL, which is passed through EDA tools. And these are some acronyms that might be new for some people. But it's basically a kind of programming, just like in software, where you describe the chip functional functionality um, at a certain abstraction level. Uh, the EDA tools and uses this uh, code to uh, do the actual chip, to convert it through many different steps. So when we talk about open source silicon, we talk both about the code and the tools. And just as a quick example, if this was very theoretical, uh, this is a small piece of Verilog code. Um, and this is what uh, one of the EDA tools would do. It would convert it to uh, something resembling a circuit. And I know that this is wrong, but I didn't have time to change it. As uh, you can find the bug, probably. Well then. Why would we use open source silicon? Uh, just like in software, there are many reasons for using open source products. Uh, and this applies both to the cores. The I should probably define what a core is. A core is a module. Uh, think of a library in software. Um, a piece of functionality that you can hook into uh, another system. So I have a closed source, I have a closed tool, and there seems to be a bug. Uh, as we all know, bugs don't exist in the, the software or hardware, uh, so this shouldn't be a problem. But if we were to come up across a bug uh, in open source, in the open source world, we have the opportunity or the uh, possibility to fix this ourselves. Um, I, know, I know that most people don't want to fix the bugs themselves, but the other option is to wait for someone else to fix it. And in the case of uh, open source. In the case of the silicon world, uh, these are expensive tools. Uh, they are moving very slow, and as a small developer, you often have no chance in, in reaching out to the customers. So we might have to wait, and waiting costs money, and we don't want to wait. You can also have a restricted license. Uh, and I mean, I talk about really, really restricted licenses. I have heard examples of. Uh, uh, IP core vendors who have forced companies to use some certain kind of uh, versioning system that have forced them to keep the computer with the, with the code in a, in a special locked room, things like that. And I mean, this also again costs money because it lowers productivity. Uh, and we do not want to be bound by these things. Documentation is lacking, once again. Uh, if it's just a black box, you have no idea what, what's going on inside. Uh, I have encountered this so many times. Uh, and again, it's just an opportunity to fix things yourself if you want to do that. Or curiosity. I mean, that's often, especially as a student or a starter in the field, you really want to know how, how code is designed, how things work. And this is an excellent opportunity to just take a look at it yourself and see that it's not magic. It's just a lot of hard work, but it's not magic. Or it misses a feature. Also very common. Add it yourself. Um, I mean, these are all very good reasons for open source silicon. But when I'm talking to people, I, especially in the industry, I notice that these two key benefits is the real reason why people want to go to open source silicon. Um, we have a serious end of life problem, and it's only getting worse by time. Uh, if you want to do a respin of an ASIC, uh, do another version you might find out that the <laughs> things that we're supposed to use aren't longer in production. And I mean, I've heard rumors of NASA uh, going to eBay to buy old 8088 processors because they couldn't find them anywhere uh, in production. Uh, if they had been using some, an open source uh, design, they might have come been able to come around this by implementing the functionality in a new chip instead. Also, gives upper hand during price negotiations. Um, 
it's a very closed world currently, and uh, the core vendors and, uh, and the EDA tool vendors, they know that they can charge a lot of money for these things. Um, let's give them some competition. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the history of open source hardware uh, or open source silicon. I should also note that open source hardware and open source silicon is not the same thing. Open source hardware is more about uh, designing things, about PCB design, about uh, 3D printing, and open source silicon is what's inside the chips. So sort of year zero is 1999. This is the year where open course started, which uh, until just recently was the biggest site for open source uh, silicon with uh, most things open source you could find there. So it was started by a bunch of Slovenian students led by Damian Lampret, who uh, wanted to build an open source CPU and some peripherals around it, like a UART and uh, basic things you need to build a system. Um, and they started open course as a site to put the open risk CPU there. And this went well. People were starting to contributing and uh, it started taking off. And then about 2001, uh, Flextronics uh, showed up with some commercial interest and saw that, aha, this is a great platform. We can use this to, uh, to build chips based on, on these technologies. Uh, so they started investing a lot of resources. They started paying development uh, of new IP cores. They started actually producing chips. Um, and things went pretty well for a while. But they eventually lost the interest. Um, and the original developers, or many of the original developers, instead formed uh, Beyond CMI, which is a company that was supposed to be uh, doing these kind of designs instead. And they're still around, Beyond CMI. So then nothing happened for a few years. Uh, the site was deteriorating, uh, not much development, of course. With open source, there was some development, uh, but not nothing to speak of. Until 2007, when a uh, Swedish company Orsok buys open course, uh, because they had all the ties with, um, uh, with Flextronics and, and had seen what was going on and thought, that, hey, we should, we should do something with this. They modernized the site. Uh, they also got some uh, commercial projects that could fund some further development. And things were again looking up. Uh, Quality was increasing, but once again, without commercial projects, uh, the development was stopping from, from the commercial side. Uh, and the difference this time is that now a small but very, very dedicated community um, had started forming around, around this that in a more consistent way drove the development. And this is where I come in. So we, now we have what I would like to call the third wave. Um, and things now are mainly driven by the community. Um, well, that's not entirely true because uh, we also have some commercial interest coming in, but I get to that later. So, to take a look at the timeline. Uh, we see a few milestones here. We see something called Risk Five. Uh, which I will talk more about later, which has gained a lot of commercial interest uh, and it becomes something really big. You will probably find it on most tech medias uh, today. We see development on completely open source tools to build FPGAs uh, of the project iStorm. We started the Fossey Foundation to, to capture the energy of, of the community, to to build something stable, uh, stable base, stable foundation um, for open source silicon development. You also see other, other things like FPGA is becoming a commodity. Uh, it's now very cheap. You can find FPGA boards for 40, 50 euro, uh, which are runnable from your, from your Raspberry Pi. And I mean, the, the Open source silicon or the silicon world is a lot smaller than the software world. But now we're also seeing the software developers entering the field. And this is a good thing because now we suddenly have a lot more manpower uh, to, to work on these things. 
And OverConf, as Andreas mentioned, has now grown to become the largest uh, conference in Europe with these kind of things. Uh, I would say the Risk Five workshop is in the US is still bigger, but it's not. It's mostly concerned with the Risk Five. Uh, this is about the OverConf is about everything else. So we're done. Yes. Yes, I have a question. Uh, maybe I'm not getting the basic model of it, but uh, from open source silica, uh, you know, how is commercial gain tied? How are you making money from this? Well, uh, I would say that most, take a CPU for example, this is one of the most common examples. Most companies don't sell CPUs, they sell products. They are currently paying, for example, ARM for a CPU license. These are money that could be spent somewhere else, so which is why uh, companies like Google, HP, uh, NVIDIA, uh, Lattice and many others are now funding the Risk Five Foundation because they want to spend the money building something that they can use for free instead of uh, buying something. Just like in the software world where we have, I mean li Linux is free but you build stuff based on Linux. Okay, so we found like we're done, everything is working out fine. It's not. We have some challenges. And the first one is licenses. And this is really, really, really important because uh, as in the open source world, we had had a lot of problems with licenses. I mean, we, we had a lot of problems with people not following the licenses and not uh, complying to them. Uh, these, I would say that the situation is a lot better nowadays. Things are much better understood. But when we try to use these classical uh, open source licenses like the GPL or the LGPL on silicon, we come across some problems. Like for example, as I say on the slide here, uh, even if the code is, is um, open source, how you can't really build a chip from only code. You need, uh, you need some data from the ASIC foundries, you need a lot of other things and when it comes to GPL, you should you should um, be able to to rebuild the things yourself if you if you comply to the GPL license. Uh, but you can't do that because the foundries won't let you use their files or the technologies. And still, I mean, it's hard <laughs> to build a build a chip. Uh, so what we're seeing now is a, is a new family of licenses coming up, which are more suitable for silicon. And I mentioned the ta Tapper OHL, SolarPad and CERN OHL, and these are mostly concerned with the hardware side, not the silicon side. So, but the things are getting better. We need to try them. We need to make sure that everyone is, knows what they mean, the licenses. Uh, until then, we have a challenge. What does work very well is MIT and, and the BSD licenses because they are more or less applicable to, to silicon uh, just as software. Then we have the tools. You need code and you need tools to build the devices. And when you're doing, when you're building a chip, you want to run simulations first to see that things are working. Because once you have produced the ASIC, it's very expensive to do it again. So, on the simulation side, things are quite good. We have some, some open source tools that work for, for a large amount of projects. Uh, they don't work for all projects, and especially the language report is a bit shaky sometimes. And this is a huge difference between the fields. I mean, in software, <coughs> all new language standards are driven by open source implementations, first of all, like Python, like C, like C++. Uh, you have the LVM or GCC implementing the standard first. Here you have s a few proprietary companies uh, who implement the standard, each one in a different way, of course. Uh, and the open source tools are lagging behind. When it comes to FPGA implementation, it's a bit worse. Uh, I will talk about Project iStorm later on, which is a really cool project, uh, which is now allow you to build uh, FPGA, uh, an FPGA image for with completely open source tools. But for other devices, not that good. 
the SPJ vendors often give you uh, a free version of, of the commercial tools for, for limited use, uh, which is very good. But there are some, I mean, you, you, don't, you still have the problems with, um, w w with if you find a bug, for example, which happens from time to time. Uh, you, you need open source tools for, for many cases. When it comes to ASIC implementation, the situation is, yeah, forget it. There's no way right now. Next thing is IP cores. And as I said, OpenRISC started in 1999. Uh, there's been a lot of IP cores uh, on open cores for a long time. Um, so I mean, we have hundreds or probably thousands of IP cores out there. Many of them are very good. Many of them are used commercially. Many of them are used in places you, you aren't aware, like the OpenRISC CPU is used in Samsung digital TVs. It's been sent up to space uh, in a NASA satellite. Uh, it's used in SIGBA ASICs. I know that it's used uh, somewhere in a, in a telecom company. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say the name. Um, but the problem is people don't know them. People don't know they exist. Or if they don't know that they exist, they don't trust them because mistakes cost a lot of money and, and you, don't, you don't dare to, to take the chance to see if, if they work. You, you rather buy something instead. And when you try to use them, as always with uh, <laughs> both open and closed tools, you have the problem of documentation, how to, uh, how to work with them. And these three pillars I would like to come. Visibility, trustability, usability are something that we have seen is very important that we take care of. Uh, sorry, what, yes? do, what do we mean by an IP code? Is it just a piece of HDL code? Aha, uh -huh. good question. I didn't say that. Uh, yes, it's a piece of, like say a um, say, uh, SPI uh, peripheral controller. Uh, it might consist of several HDA modules uh, connected together, but, but the, whole, the whole functionality is what we call an, an IP core. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a function. Yeah, it's just some text files, but uh, how do we know, as you said, that it's, it works and it passes all the constraints and there are no bugs in it? Mm. The, the, the problem, the problem is, is the same with both open and source tools. You, you can't, really, can't really know. What you can do is that you can provide simulations to prove that, so, so you can let the user themselves try and see that this works. You can have certifications, for example. Uh, I know like for interfaces like CAN, you can, you can have official certification, which I know is done on, on, on one prominent open source core. Um, and yeah, you can have different kind of metrics to, to show that this, this seems to work. And, and when we say open source, is it synonymous to free? Right? So not, not necessarily. I, I'm, when I'm, it's a very good question also. <laughs> because, I mean, when I'm talking about open source silicon, now I'm talking about free and open source silicon. So the distinction here is that open source is just a technical thing. It's that you can see the source code. Free software. Um, is, is comes with a set of, of uh, extra rules that you often say that you, you can't make these closed stores again. You have to, to, uh, to, to keep these open. So these are more, so free, the free part is, is more like, um, like the agreement between the, the author and, and the user. And the open source is the way, the way we, we convey this information. Very good. Did that answer your question? No, I'm, I'm just <laughs> thinking about the comparison, if I have to make a comparison with the commercially available black box core. Yeah. So I have a choice either to pay for a black box, which is completely tested and sort of guaranteed to work. So they say at least. And uh, another thing for which I'm going to pay, but it's not guaranteed to work, but I have the access to the internals of the black box. So that's mm. the trade-off. Um, well, so well, I have to pay in both the cases. Yeah, but, but you can come across a situation where you have a black box which you don't know if it's tested. They say it's tested. That's 
uh, usually a case. You're not always getting the, the test vectors, or it's not tested for your application anyway. So you still need to integrate it in, in your device to see that it works in your environment, because you ha might have some special kind of clock constraints you need to, to run at an extremely slow clock, for example, which might not have been tested. Uh, and with open source, uh, in open source case, you can have a top-notch test uh, bench for this. You can have formal verification. You can have everything that proves that this core does what it's supposed to do. But I will get back to that because it's important. Um, so, Foster Foundation. I'll talk a bit about Foster Foundation. Now, this is an idea that we've been kicking around for a few years. And about two years ago, we, we decided that, yeah, we should really start a foundation too. Because we saw there were so many projects everywhere. Uh, and, and no one was speaking to each other. No one knew that uh, someone else was, was around. And uh, we had been doing overconf for a few years. Uh, and we saw that the, 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 the world was growing. Uh, open source silicon was really taking off. Uh, and we thought that just like in the software world, we need some kind of stability, uh, a base to, for, for this development. So we started the Foster Foundation. Uh, we launched it at our conf in CERN last year, uh, so it's just become one year now. Uh, and we have a mission to suppo support and promote open standards development and the use. Open standards is hugely important uh, because it defines how uh, it defines our interoperability between uh, tools and the course and between cores themselves. We want to support community events, and Overconf is our main event. We're uh, actually talking about doing uh, something similar in uh, somewhere in Asia. And we are reaching out to the US also to see if we can do something there. Uh, and we want to encourage the industry participation because, I mean, we're, most of us are working in the industry and we want the industry support in this. We're, we're not trying to fight against the industry, we're trying to make the industry move faster. And at Overconf, just the last week, we had a guy called Gagan Gupta, who's um, uh, working for Microsoft Research, and he did a, did a paper, which I recommend everyone to read, about the challenges and opportunities of open source silicon. Um, and what he said that, what he saw was that the open, the, the silicon world, the, EDI, the se semiconductor world is moving very slowly. We have a few huge companies but we have very little innovation. For every startup in the, in the semi field, there's 500 or 1,000 startups in the software field. And this, this is not very good. It's not healthy for the, for the industry. So we think that by lowering the uh, barrier of entry, uh, we can also get a lot more innovation, a lot more work in the field, uh, which is, in the end, a very good thing. Uh, we also see that many people want to do open source and academia, uh, as, as in many other cases, they don't really know how to do things. Uh, so we want to help both hobbyists and academic institutions uh, with opening up the course, opening up the tools, uh, because in many cases, as I said, they want to do it, but they don't know how. So our main activities, Overconf, as I men mentioned, and uh, Andrew has mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's our annual open source silicon conference. Uh, more on that later, and also more on LibreCore later, which is our community website, which is becoming something very good. We also participated in Google Summer of Code this year. We had three excellent students. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Google Summer of Code. One. <laughs> OK, so Google Summer, Summer of Code is a project where uh, Google pays students uh, working on open source projects. Um, the open source project IDs come from uh, different open source organizations <coughs> like Linux Foundation, Apache, Python, and Foster Foundation. And we provide a mentor for the, for the student to help them uh, reach the project goal. Uh, and then they work. And we are very happy with this, and we do it again. We also had a student design contest, which is a bit similar. We uh, let students submit their the best uh, open source silicon work. And uh, we had some really, really <laughs> advanced stuff. We had like a, a static timing analyzer, for example. We had a SDR, no, DDR, DDR uh, controller written in System C. We had many others I can't remember right now. We have very good 
uh, submissions coming in. And we're now also uh, driving development of the Wishbone Interconnect standard um, together with the original uh, Wishbone author. LibreCourse, I mentioned. So I said that OpenCourse started in 1999. Uh, it has had its up and downs. Mostly what we see nowadays are downs. And we have seen the writing on the wall for a long time that this is maintained by a commercial entity who, which, and the funding depends on what, what they're working on. So we wanted to have something stable for, for the community, something modern. And I mentioned these three pillars before, visibility, trustability, usability. These are what we're working on uh, in different ways with LibreCourse. So the first thing we launched was a, was a news aggregator, uh, so you can get all the, all the news about open source silicon collected in one place. Uh, what we have been working on and just revealed at, at OrConf uh, this weekend is uh, a project indexing. You can submit your projects there and they will, we will provide links to, to the source code, to the documentation as a way to, to find all the different projects going on. Because, I mean, most people store their projects on GitHub or, or private uh, servers nowadays. Um, it's very hard to find things. So we want to collect all the interesting projects here. And we're also working with continuous integration. And this is a big thing. We just la launched uh, our Jenkins infrastructure uh, for doing continuous integration. And this is one of the things where we hope to get more quality metrics. Uh, as you said, uh, we don't know if they work. Continuous integration is one of the ways we can, we can uh, have a better look at how, how the cores are performing. We're also looking at adding things like quality metrics, user feedback to, to have the community themselves tell, is this, this is working? Uh, has anyone tried this? Is, has it been implemented in FPGA? It's been taped out in ASIC, uh, which technology nodes, things like that. And we also want to document best practices, uh, integrated package managers, uh, because we have a wild west right now when it comes to, to doing development. So these are things looking forward to, to implement everything. Our other main activity, our conf, uh, we just had this weekend. Um, videos will be posted uh, shortly on, on the Fossil Foundation YouTube channel, so you can I mean, I don't think any one of you be, were there, so uh, you, can, you can look at all the great talks we had. Three days of uh, talks, over 30 talks, 140 attendees, from industry, from academia, hobbyists, a melting pot. And I mean, as much as it's, it's about the talks, it's always about, also about the hallway conversations. You can see everyone is, uh, is busy talking to each other, and you can see, yeah, we should talk more, we should do, we should do this, I have this, uh, you have this. And then next year you see, ah, they have done something together. And it's a really, really good thing to see. I, that's one of my absolutely favorite parts about this. And I just mentioned a few products that were represented. I mean, these are, these are basically most of the, the open source silicon projects out there uh, coming to overcome nowadays. Another thing that annoyed me when I started in this field was, I mean, I, I come from, from the software field as well, uh, and we have things like package managers, dependency resolution. We have software is hierarchical. You have an uh, application depending on library, depending on other libraries uh, down the stream. Uh, it's the same thing about the Silicon world. It's even more hierarchical and, and modular, but still everyone would just taking this core and putting it in a repository and doing some changes and you, you don't know what, wh when things change and it was just a huge mess. Um, so I decided to start building a package manager and a build system because these are tools that were lacking um, on, on the hardware side or the silicon side. Um, I won't go much into detail but uh, it's, uh, it's a very good uh, application uh, and we use it uh, as part of the uh, LibreCourse now uh, together hooked up uh, to our Jenkins instance to to have a coherent interface for the, for the continuous integration. 
ILOS also integrated it into the VUnit um, uh, VHDL testing environment. Uh, and uh, it's, it's supposed to be used both as a standalone tool and to integrate into other projects. I'm happy to talk more about that uh, afterwards. Probably the project with the most news around it is the RISC V. And we, we have had open source CPUs for many years, I would say 20 years. Nothing has happened. I mean, we have had a few implementations, but suddenly something happened. And let's say in 2014, RISC-V was in every news media. Uh, not every, but uh, every tech news media. Um, so what is it? It's uh, ISA, just like ARM or uh, ARMS, I don't know what they call them, V7 and V8, or, uh, or uh, Intel's x86, or uh, MIPS, or Spark. Uh, it's completely open. And here we have to be careful because RISC V is the specification, it's the ISA. Then we have implementations, and there are a lot of implementations. The first one is called Rocket and was created by uh, in a new language that they also developed called Chisel, which is built on Scala. A lot of words here. Uh, but also at Overconf last year, we saw 11 new different. Risk V implementation being presented at one conference. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot of implementations going around, closed and open. I mean, Nvidia announced at the Risk V workshop earlier this year that they were using Risk V internally in their devices. You won't see the source code of this, but okay, their choice. Uh, and we have, I mean, this is a foundation that has attracted a lot of funding. Uh, we have there have over 40 paying members. Um, who wants to drive the development because they see that they want to have something that they can use freely that is a high quality. They want the CPU to be good, they want the ISA to be good, they want the tools to be good. I mean, a CPU is only as good as its software and its ecosystem, so you need compilers, you need the bug, uh, the bug environments and things like that. And it's already in use in many places. I mentioned the Axiom, it's a, it's a EU funded uh, camera project, an open source camera project. Um, the Low Risk Foundation, which is uh, which are planning to build uh, a completely open source ASIC uh, based on Risk Five and uh, many other technologies. And I said Nvidia. Apart from that, there are also many tools now coming up. I said there's lots of software engineers sent in the field, and they are just coming into the, uh, the FPGA ASIC field and they say, you can't seriously work with these languages. I mean, we have Verilog, we have VHDL. These are two really, really crappy languages. It's like the Stockholm Syndrome, I think. Uh, HDL designers think that they are using the best thing ever when it's just, it just not. So we have a lot of innovation, people expecting things to be good. Yosis, as I mentioned, or Project iStorm. Project iStorm is built around Yosis and a few other programs. It's, it's more like a suite of, uh, of tools. It's a completely open source tool flow going from Verilog code to uh, bitstream implementations on FPGA, which is the first time so I know this happened. This is synthesis, this is placing route, this is bitstream generation and timing analysis. Uh, it also runs on a Raspberry Pi and uh, traditionally we have only been able to build FPGAs on servers or desktop or laptops. Uh, now we can move the generation tools into the embedded system. And I'm sure that this will open up a lot of new innovation. And if you read, you see new projects come up every day, uh, new innovative projects uh, based on these, this technology. And I hope we'll see more of this in the future. Uh, we also have some uh, older tools like Verilator, which is a super fast simulator for, for HCL code, for mostly for very log code. And this has been around for a while. But I'm mentioning it because it's, it's not only a copy of a, of a commercial tool. It's something that is, in many cases, better than the commercial tools uh, for the right designs. Uh, it allows you to, uh, for example, I, I try to boot up Linux on a, on a simulated CPU in, 
in uh, model sim or in Icarus Verilog, and it takes yeah about 24 hours or so. I can do this uh, in Verilator in 10 minutes instead. We also have the tools: Icarus Verilog, GHDL for uh, VHDL programming. We have a standard called IPXact, uh, and we have a tool called Cactus2, uh, which is done by some Finnish uh, people uh, to to provide an environment around the IPXact format. We have also presented at Orconf uh, Eclipse-based HDL plugin with EDA tool integration. So, I mean, these are just a few examples of the tools. Yes. Sorry, wh why would you like to run this suite on Raspberry Pi? I didn't get the idea. If you can run it on your home laptop or something, why would I like to run it on Raspberry Pi? Yeah, I don't know. No, but uh, seriously, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, reasons for this. I mean, for example, if you want to do some kind of quick reconfiguration in an I IoT node or something like that, I'm making up an example here, but uh, you want to do, uh, uh, you have an FPGA which is performing a certain task, you can quickly reconfigure it to do something else on the node where you have all the information. You can also in schools, for example, you can you can just throw out your Raspberry Pi, and they can quickly get along with with their development. You can you get a closer bond between the CPU and, and the FPGA. Uh, I I'm still waiting to see the killer application for this, but I I think it opens up a lot of new innovation. It attracts a lot of software people. Yeah, now now that you talk of it, what use one use case I can see it uh, re reusable embedded self-contained platform yeah. where you can reconfigure it without you know yeah. having a, a PC interface. Or something. Yeah, self-contained is the key word I would say. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> well, so conclusions. Um, I'll take the next slide. I think that a lot have happened. We have 20 years of history. We have seen what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we are now the, the open source silicon community and the industry is, is maturing. We see a lot of industrial support now from different ways, not just a single company investing resources. We see a more sustainable movement. We have a lot of more contributors. Uh, we still have a lot of challenges, but these are, we are able to overcome them. And we're not looking at throwing out all proprietary technologies. We're looking at increasing our productivity, uh, helping smaller startups form, uh, and to build a better semiconductor world. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, uh, I have one. Uh, could you give us uh, some, some brief uh, history of how you ended up in this, uh, with, 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 with what you are working with now? Yes. Um, okay, so I, I, I did my... I, I've been doing open source software for a long time as a hobby. Um, and I started my master thesis, my master studies, uh, doing FPGA because I found it was very challenging and fun to do a work on constrained platform. Uh, <laughs> and when I started work, I, I had this open source software background, and I met some people from uh, from Orsoc who owns Open Course, and they wanted to hire me, and then I got into the field of. Seeing that, oh, that's a. I, I knew about knew about open source Silicon World, about Open Risk and, and other things, but I didn't really use them. Uh, but when I got closer to to the Open Course community, I, I started also looking into this, and then I got stuck. Now I'm here. I call this my jobby. It's uh, it's a combination of job and hobby. If uh, one is interested to, to help out in one way or the other, or just take a part and see what's happening, uh, where is the best way to go and look for information? Uh, I would say if, if you want to, to see a bit about what's going on, I would recommend just reading the, our news aggregator at uh, LibreCourse.org. Uh, you can find a sticker here. Um, it's a good way to see, see what, what kind of projects are available. Uh, we also have the mailing lists, uh, where we currently are in a huge discussion about GPL and the non-commercial licenses, uh, which is probably boring for many people, but it's extremely important. Uh, LibreCourse, we're, we're just warming up. We're planning on 
putting a lot of projects there. We're planning on, <laughs> we're asking every, everyone to put their own projects there. So I hope we will have a good portfolio of, of what's available there soon. Um, you can see the Fossil Foundation website also, see a bit more why we're doing this, uh, what, what our main goals are. Um, just get in touch with us. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good question you're raising. We should make it clear for everyone coming in, entering the field what they could do if they, if they are interested. But LibreCourse.org and FossilFoundation.org are our main entry points for now. Yes? Does this LibCore work more like a GitHub where you can just go and uh, you know, push your uh, uh, a random XYZ core uh, and then everybody can access it? How, how, how no. The thing is, I mean, with OpenCourse they had, they started out with CVS code hosting, then they converted everything to SVN. Uh, and that's currently stuck on SVN code hosting. We're not doing code hosting because there are so many other uh, Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab. Everyone is doing it better than we could possibly hope to do. But we're, we're focusing on the, on the things that we find important. That you should be able to find the things, and we link to we we'll let people link to the original source code. But we're also looking at some kind of integration. I said uh, integrate with package manager. We're thinking of building a web uh, REST API for LibreCourse, so you can. You can find, if you have a core, and, and you can specify which dependencies you have and, and things like that. Like modern package management would work. Okay. Yes? What's the fundamental uh, philosophy behind the risk five? Is it like you download the source code and then do it yourself? Or, or you said, you also said that you have an it's taped out, so what EBA tools have been used. So what I'm asking is, um, do you also recommend the, the whole EDA chain? The? The, the tool chain. Yes. Or, or if I'm planning to use CRISPR, I just take the RTL and use my own tool chain. Um, you see also, in, instead of using Is it, uh, do I take the RTL and implement it myself, or? I mean, if you have a, f a finished uh, image? I, I'm using it, how do I really use the RISC file? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of ways. I mean, if you want to do it, just run it on a PC. Uh, this guy called Sebastian Macke, uh, he's, a, he's a physicist, and, and he thought, hmm, maybe I should learn JavaScript. So as a first project, he did an open risk. CPU in JavaScript, which now allows you to boot uh, Open Risk, Linux on Open Risk in a, in a web browser, and, and which is pretty amazing. And they did a port to Risk Five, uh, and that's why I mentioned this. I mean, if you want to want to try out some software running on Risk Five, you could do it in a web browser. If you want to do it, they, they also have like software simulations, uh, which are much faster, I guess. Uh, but if you want to run it on a chip, I think they have prepackaged versions for. Uh, common boards like the set boards and things like that. And, and my, my Google Summer of Code student this year, um, Elias, he ported the Risk Five to the Adaptiva Parallela board. Uh, so you, you, can, you, can, you can download ready-made images if you just want to, to use Risk Five. You don't need to build it from RTL yourself. Uh, but there are also, I mean, uh, for Fusok I have packaged like five different RISC-V implementations and, and a few systems that you can, you can build yourself uh, targeting different FPGA boards. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any ASICs which are commercially available that you can use to try out RISC-V, but uh, these, there was a group of Colombian um, researchers uh, who just revealed their own 32-bit RISC-V implementation. They had a chip with them to overconf which they had wire bonded by hand. Uh, it seems like a very hard thing to do, but uh, they managed. So I think, uh, yeah, so if you just want to use it, the, these are the ways I would recommend. Did that answer your question? Oh. So if 
I want to uh, contribute with some of my hardware course. What's the uh, in, in a very straight uh, uh, in, in a summarized fashion, what's the way to do that? Do I need to ask permission from somebody in lib course or library course? Or okay, so, so you, ha you have some HTML code, you have an IP core, yeah. Uh, put it on your favorite hosting place, say GitHub. Uh, put the, add the project to Libre course so other people can find it easily. Okay, so I just need to provide the link to where it... Where yeah, it then they need to pay me a, a large fee as well. <laughs> okay, okay. And th that's the next question. Yes. Is there anybody making money out of my course in uh, LibreCore? So if somebody is going to use it, will uh, LibreCore be getting uh, any license fee or anything? No, I mean, I mean, it's up to the core author to specify the license. Uh, and I mean, if you're using an MIT or a BSD license, you're, you're probably, you, you can't do very much. You're, you're allowing everyone to use your core freely. If you're using a GPL license, for example, uh, first problem is that they are not really applicable to, to hardware, but if you do, uh, then I would expect you, you, people, researchers can use it, students can use it, uh, but you can't really ship a commercial project based on it. And m many in the, in the open source silicon field are actually using this as some kind of copy control. They release GPL licensed cores because they know that these can't be used commercially, but then they also have the opportunity to dual license the course. You can get a commercial license for it as well. But it's up to you as author to decide that. That seems ah oh, perfect. How is it with the compatibility compatibility um, between the different tool chains and the code which is available, for example, on open course? I mean, can I use the code which is on open course? compile it with the Altera tools and it works fine, or do I have to do a lot of um, modifications? Because you said that the implementations between the different companies of the standard, they are different. So I guess also that compilation or... Yeah, I mean, uh, HTL code by itself is, is portable. Ver Verlog of HTL code runs on, on, on all devices. The thing is that what you're doing, uh, what you can do is that you can, you can instantiate technology-specific primitives, as we call them. I mean, these are these are uh, pieces of functionality that's only available in, in one FPGA family or the other. Then you restrict the, uh, the options to, to use this on a, on a competing vendor. And we try to stay away from this. And I know I've been working for, for huge uh, companies which uh, need to be able to move quickly between Silinx and Altera platforms for price negotiations, for, uh, so they can get the best FPGA devices. And they are very good at keeping the code free from these kind of things. Uh, but most, many smaller companies doesn't care. We say, oh, we always go with Altera, or we always go with Silink, so we, we don't really care. So it, it's how you write the code. If you use a lot of technology-specific things, then yes, it will be harder to port it, uh, but you can get around this in most cases. Or provide alternatives, like saying, if this is an Altera device, I use this kind of thing. If it's a Silink device, I use this instead. <coughs> Make them compete with each other. That's how we, how we rule them. All right then. Uh, ah. For verification, uh, are you also looking into the UVM? Uh, is there any plans for that? Yes, I mean, UVM is, is a library built upon System Verilog, and it's very much used in, in different parts of the industry. Um, I won't say it's a good thing, uh, <laughs> but it's better than what was before. Um, <coughs> it's a matter of the tools implementing enough system Verilog to run UVM. And I'm actually not sure if, if uh, the tools are good enough yet. So, but this, I mean, open, UVM is open source itself, isn't it? Yeah. So, but we also see a lot of different uh, strategies in UVM. We have CocoaTB, for example, which is a Python implementation. We have UVVM, which is a VHDL implementation. So, um, I said I, I I don't know if UVM can be used with open tools yet. Uh, I need to check this up. Uh, but also that there are alternatives to UVM.
Well, please come and chat with me afterwards if you have more questions. Thank you. And grab some stickers.